Hi guys, welcome back to the channel. For those of you new, hi, my name is Matt and I'm a doctor currently working in the UK. So today I want to talk to you about CRISPR. CRISPR is a technology for editing genes and presents a whole plethora of opportunities to a wide range of industries, but none more so than healthcare. CRISPR gives you the ability to edit a person's genes and therefore theoretically gives us the ability to cure a whole range of medical conditions, including genetic conditions such as sickle cell anemia, and could also revolutionize the way we treat cancer. Now CRISPR has been used in research for a long time, but now we're starting to see companies take this technology to create novel therapeutics. It's undeniable that CRISPR will completely change the world and the way we treat our patients. So before we can understand CRISPR, we first need to understand a bit about DNA, or to give it its full name, deoxynucleic acid. DNA has a double helix structure and is made up of four different nitrogen-based molecules, adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. These are collectively known as bases. These bases pair up with one another to form the double helix, but only with their complementary base. So adenine always pairs with thymine, while guanine always pairs with cytosine. The order that these bases appear in your genetic code determines everything about us, genetically speaking anyway. So your eye color, how tall you're likely to be, whether we're susceptible to certain diseases, it's all written in the base pairs in our genetic code. How this works is based on the essential dogma of DNA, and that is that DNA makes RNA makes protein. But what does this mean? DNA is stored in the nucleus of our cells, but the information stored in our DNA can't be used directly to make the proteins that make up your individual characteristics. In order for that process to happen, DNA must first be converted into something called RNA, or ribonucleic acid. RNA is almost identical to DNA, but there is one important difference. Instead of the base thymine, RNA uses a similar base called uracil. The same pairing rules apply, but instead of thymine binding to cytosine, uracil binds instead. In order to make RNA, the DNA unzips its double helix and exposes its bases. RNA bases can then bind to the exposed bases and make their own RNA strands, which are a complementary sequence to the DNA. RNA then travels to specialized proteins in the cell called ribosomes. The ribosomes then use the genetic code in the RNA to produce proteins by assembling amino acids, which are the building blocks of proteins. The order of your amino acids depends on the order of bases in your genetic code. Now, don't worry about the details too much, but having this basic understanding will help us understand the basics of CRISPR. CRISPR is actually a natural process which evolved as a way of some species of bacteria to defend themselves against viral invaders. Each time the bacteria faced a new virus, they would capture snippets of DNA from that virus's genome and create a copy to store in its own DNA. These snippets of viral DNA act like a memory bank of the individual viruses the bacterium has encountered, each one containing the data that allows the bacterium to recognize and quickly kill off a virus next time it invades. In between these chunks of useful DNA, there are slightly less useful chunks of repetitive DNA keeping them separate, like a divider between each viral segment. These repeating segments of DNA are what gives CRISPR its name, CRISPR stands for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats. CRISPRs are a specialized region of DNA with two distinct characteristics. The presence of nucleotide repeats, so short sections of repeated bases, which are adjacent to sections referred to as spaces. The spaces are somewhat confusingly named as it's these regions that actually contain the reference to the viral DNA and the nucleotide repeats that partition the different spaces. Once the spacer is incorporated into the bacterium's DNA, and the virus attacks again, a portion of the CRISPR is transcribed and processed into CRISPR RNA. So the nucleotide sequence of the CRISPR acts as a template to reduce a complementary sequence of single-stranded RNA. Each CRISPR RNA therefore consists of a nucleotide repeat and a spacer portion. This is where something called the Cas9 protein comes in. The Cas9 protein is an enzyme that cuts up DNA. An enzyme is just a protein that acts as a catalyst to speed up a particular biochemical reaction. The Cas9 protein binds to the CRISPR RNA, as well as another section of RNA that's encoded in the bacterial host DNA, called transactivating CRISPR RNA. The two then guide Cas9 to the target site on the viral DNA. If the CRISPR RNA is complementary to a section on the viral DNA, then this activates the Cas9 enzyme. The enzyme then cuts the viral DNA, which deactivates the virus. But of course, this is only useful if you're a bacterium, which the majority of you watching probably aren't. So how do we take this bacterial antiviral system and turn it into a gene editing system? So effectively, the bacterial system gave us the blueprints of how a system like this could work. But scientists have taken it one step further and created their own CRISPR regions within the lab. If you think about it, all you need to do is find a region in your target DNA that you want to edit, and then create a strand of DNA complementary to that region. 
So if we had a DNA strand like this, and we wanted to target this section of the DNA, we just need a complementary RNA strand like this. Once you know what section of DNA you want to target, the CRISPR-Cas9 complex can get to work. The Cas9 enzyme starts by unzipping bits of the DNA double helix, while the RNA molecule works its way along the exposed base pairs looking for a perfect match. Once the perfect match is found, Cas9 cuts out the gene at this point. At this point, the cell's natural DNA repair mechanism kicks in. The DNA can be repaired in two ways. The first is by simply reconnecting the two strand ends, but this process of repair is very error prone, so usually results in an inactive gene. So if your intent is to disable the function of a particular gene, then this can be a very effective method. However, genes can also be repaired by injecting another strand of DNA at the section where the split in the DNA was made, therefore editing the function of the gene. This is true genetic engineering and is far more complicated to do than simply knocking out a gene's function. Thanks for watching the video guys. If you got value from this video, make sure you press the like button and consider subscribing to the channel. And as always, happy devin guys, and I'll see you in the next video.